Quer desenvolver os talentos da sua equipe e potencializar os resultados da sua empresa? Conte com a expertise do atendimento corporativo do Senac São Paulo, que já capacitou mais de um milhão de pessoas e profissionais de instituições públicas, privadas e terceiro setor. Construa uma equipe altamente motivada e capacitada e destaque-se no mercado. Entre em contato, acesse sp.senac.br barra corporativo e saiba mais. Quer saber? Senac. RH, quer saber como voar no trabalho? É só usar a Flash. Com a Flash, você concentra toda a gestão de pessoas em um único lugar. Faça a admissão dos colaboradores e solicite mais de oito categorias de benefícios. Ah, e você ainda pode fazer todo o controle de ponto. Conheça o novo onboarding integrado da Flash em flashapp.com.br. Oi, desculpa interromper seu podcast. Você vende em marketplaces e tá sem margem de lucro? Crie sua loja online na Nuvem Shop e venda sem taxas abusivas, com planos grátis ou avançados para todos os tamanhos de negócio. Grandes empreendedores como Joel J, Camila Farani e mais de 130 mil lojas estão com a gente. Acesse nosso site Nuvem Shop. A paixão por empreender nos une. So you would welcome an XRP ETF then? We would certainly welcome it. And I think it's inevitable that there'll be, you know, multiple ETFs around different uh, tokens. I think you'll even see ETFs potentially around baskets that also, I think, further diversify that risk. Uh, are you in talks with the largest issuers, particularly BlackRock, to get this done? Well, uh, I'm not going to comment on that. I know BlackRock has said some things publicly. Uh, you know, we think it makes sense for the XRP community overall. Uh, you know, Ripple obviously is a very important stakeholder in the XRP ecosystem, but we're not the only player. And look, we, we've seen, I mean, before the SEC lawsuit, XRP was the second most valuable digital asset. I think because of the headwinds of that lawsuit, you know, we've now seen that largely abate. Uh, but the long-term view on these things is about, you know, how do you create utility and really solve real world problems with these different digital assets? See. And that's what we're doing this morning, guys. Good morning, Warriors. Hello and welcome back to another episode of your favorite crypto news channel, Good Morning Crypto, where we bring you the most relevant and impactful crypto related topics from a top crypto research team in the world. And we're getting started on a strong note this morning because we got two massive articles, Johnny. First of all, Palu has, pu has publicly partnered with Ripple this morning to create a US dollar stablecoin within their borders. Second of all, we already got the second XRP ETF filed inside the United States. But most importantly, we got our friend Echo X joining us this morning. So first of all, Johnny, how are you feeling? And thank you for being Abs, I'm feeling great. It's great to be here. I feel like a guest now. I have been here that much anymore. But good morning to all the Warrior Maniacs. Love and appreciate you guys. I'm muting my phone, Abs, because I know everybody's going to ask. So I got the phone muted. You won't have to hear my ringer today, but I am so excited. We got our man Echo here. It's been a while, brother. I can't wait to hop into it with you, see what's going on. It's going to be fun today. Echo, it's going to be an exciting episode. I barely even had to prepare. The articles pretty much prepared themselves this morning. We're also going to tie a couple of interesting topics. So last night, supposedly, Satoshi Nakamoto was revealed, and I know you have some analysis on that, so I want to get into it. But first of all, how are you feeling, and what was your reaction here? If I can, I'd like to ask you a question to begin the show. Yeah, last week was probably the largest roller coaster of emotions we've ever experienced in the XRP community. One hour, we're getting the first XRP ETF filing. The next hour, we're seeing the SEC's enforcement director step down. And that same day, obviously, the appeal was filed. So if you want to talk about an emotional roller coaster, I think we've all aged about a year in the past week. But first of all, how are you feeling this morning? And what was your reaction there? I'm feeling much better. I'm feeling more, much more better than I was last week, right? Um, it definitely is an emotional roller coaster. I want to say a shout out first and foremost. Thank you very much, Ab, for having me on. You know, good morning, Crypto and the crew out there. Uh, shout out to uh, Johnny Crypto and Coach JB. Um, thank you all very much for having me on. Um, so, you know, last week was an emotional roller coaster. I mean, I'm not going to lie to you all. I was put on to the fact that, hey, man, maybe they, they won't appeal, right? Because 
there was so much evidence surrounding around the information. And I'm not going to lie to you, you know, I, I put I put a little bit too much hope into it. But at the end of the day, you know, the, the fact of the matter is, right, the XRP is not a security, you know, and I, and I have to always remind myself that and always remind, you know, people that are following me and everyone as well that like, hey, XRP is not security. Countries around the world are adopting this information, adopting this technology, and they don't care about the SEC. Right. Eventually, at the end of the day, and this is a good point because you mentioned Palau, right? This is a that's a good reason to showcase, like saying, hey, these other countries are moving along forward without these other regulations. Right. So unfortunately, you know, it didn't come, you know, it didn't end like the way we wanted it to. But, you know, at the end of the day, it's still going to continue on and this technology is going to continue to grow. And you know what's exciting, Echo? And we can just dive right into the show, guys. We already got 1,375 live listeners here. Show us some love. Smash that like button. Shout out to our boy Echo for joining us this morning. But Johnny, this is something that gets me excited. Everybody's reacting to the SEC appeal. And is that going to play out? Are we going to go to the Second Circuit? Are we going to be sitting here in January of 2026 talking about the Ripple lawsuit? I doubt it. And this exact reason is why I feel that way, guys. We're looking at the polls right now. And there's a 54% chance on the poly markets that we see a, a crypto friendly administration coming this November but regardless both administrations have become pro crypto Johnny so I did just want to throw this out there there's a lot of talk about the ripple appeal I think depending on who's elected this November that may become irrelevant and the reason for that is there's rumors circulating right now that Dan Gallagher the current chief legal officer at Robin Hood who's very pro crypto could be the next SEC chairman if Trump is elected so that's really exciting and I want to kind of start off today's show with that if we could, Johnny, I'm going to cover some of the daily movers and kick it over to you, my friend. We got Bitcoin trading at $62,090. Ethereum is $2,459. Solana is trading at $142. And XRP trading at $0.53 cents this morning. And I want to start off with a little analysis from BC Backer. Because what did we get this morning, Johnny? A very bullish comparison between the MicroStrategies price chart and the Bitcoin price chart. And so with the election coming up this November, only 30 days away, I'm just tying all these different topics in together. We could see a huge administrative change in, in November. Not only is it going to be pro crypto, it's going to be pro blockchain. It's going to be pro America, hopefully, for the first time in a while, surprisingly. Second big thing here is that regardless of who's elected this November, the SEC is already publicly losing their battle against crypto. And I think that there's a lot of evidence for that we're going to take you through today. So we're going to start off with Johnny. Then we'll get into our articles. Johnny, what's your reaction here? Well, you know what, Abs? It's pretty funny. There are three wor words that the whole entire... Um, crypto community wants to hear and, and they're right here <laughs> and there is one man that can make that happen but you have to remember the funny thing is those three words are going to be in the hands of the crypto community there are 20 percent of voters that are in crypto so my friends the power is in your hands if you want a new change to top if you want to see a pro crypto administration the power is in your hands you need to get off your chairs and, and get off your butts. And a lot of young kids don't vote. So if you're a young kid and you're holding crypto and you care about the future of crypto, get off your butt and go to the ballot box. There's only one clear choice. I mean, I mean, we know they're both pro-crypto, they say, right? But there's one guy that's actually doing things about it. And it's another one that just says things about it. So the reality is, if you want to see this change and you want to hear the words, Gary, you're fired. Now, everybody's going to say in the chat, you, the sitting president can't fire. You know, that's correct. They can't. But here's what's going to happen. Okay, here's what's going to happen. First of all, a sitting president can remove a chairman if there is cause. We all know the FTX debacle is, is good enough cause. Secondly, typically what happens in these situations, Abs, is the chair serves at the at the president's you know uh, wishes, right? So what typically happens, just like Clayton did, is if, if there's a change at the top, Gary's going to resign. So we may never get to hear the words, Gary, you're fired. Although I think Trump will say it anyway. But Gary will step down if Trump wins. Guarantee. Mark that in the book. That's a giant crypto fact. It will happen. Uh, Gary will step down if Trump wins. But yeah. So message. The power is in your hands. Look yourself in the camera. Go vote. You guys have the power of who's going to be the next president in the United States. The crypto community is that powerful right now in this election, Abs. Echo, there's a lot of exciting things that we can talk about, and I just wanted to give you a quick chance to react to what Johnny had to say. We've talked about the pillars of the crypto industry for a while. That's Circle, Coinbase, and Ripple inside the United States, and those are the only three crypto companies that have publicly stated that they both met with the Harris and Trump administrations prior to this election. So we know for a fact that those three companies were a voice in the room when discussing the future of crypto with one of the future presidents. And it's pretty clear where I'm leaning, but let's tie this. Let's tie that into some of the news from yesterday and kick it over to Echo. 
What we saw yesterday was Crypto.com received a Wells notice from the SEC, and that told me the war on crypto continues from the current administration, whether it's Elizabeth Warren, Gary Gensler, Joe Biden, Kamala Harris. These are the people who are in charge of regulating the SEC right now, and I think it's really important to rem remember that the current um, Democratic candidate is the sitting vice president and could make a lot of these changes happen. People say she's not the president. She can't directly do it. She could talk to Joe Biden. She's in his ear every day. And I think that one of the things that we're witnessing is I actually believe this, Echo. Gary is doing his job, right? He's not acting out of turn. This is what he was brought in to do. And now we're seeing the industry actually come together when it's Coinbase, Ripple, Crypto.com, Kraken, Binance, all five of these major companies have been sued by the SEC. And for the first time, we're seeing Crypto.com file a countersuit against the SEC to protect the future of the U.S. crypto industry. This is a direct quote. We're doing so to protect the future of the crypto industry inside the United States, joining a series of our peers who are actively defending themselves and taking action against a misguided federal agency acting beyond its authority under the law. My comments, if only in this industry had come together four years ago, when Ripple and XRP are sued. So there's a great there's a great quote out there from Drake. Better late than never, but never late is better, guys. And what are we seeing? We're seeing the crypto industry come together and finally band against the, the regulators that are clearly acting outside of their jurisdiction. I'd love to hear whatever's on your mind, Echo. And what does this mean to you that the biggest companies in America are coming together in the blockchain space to combat the SEC's regulatory approach? Yeah, I couldn't have said it better than myself right there. <laughs> but to be honest with you, Ab, um, at the end of the day, this innovation is going to happen, right? And it's just, it just had to just play its part, in my opinion. Um, you know, unfortunately, Ripple had to, you know, unfortunately, Ripple and the XRP community had to go through what we had to go through, right? But at the end of the day, you know, we're seeing, right, you know, unfortunately, we don't have the proper regulation, right? We have these unelected bureaucrats that are inside of these offices right now that are making decisions on the behalf of the U.S. citizens and basically on the world, right? Because, you know, at the end of the day, the U.S. dollar is the center point of the whole entire global monetary system. And if they, we can't have clear regulation on this new technology, then we don't know where we stand. So right now we have to have that. So I'm very happy to hear that some of the largest institutions, some of the largest crypto platforms, right, they see the future. They want to partner up. They want to be able to fight against this, you know, in my opinion, you know, a tyranny, you know, uh, administer or government, right? Um, it's not just that, you know, it's, it's just to overhaul, it's just to, you know, overhaul it, right? Just to get clarity into it, because at the end of the day, you're going to see all these other countries outside the U.S start adopting cryptocurrency which they have right and we're going to be left in the dust and i don't know about you all but i don't want to be left in the dust especially if you know if uh crypto is supposed to be or the united states is supposed to be the crypto capital of the world here soon so if you're not going out to voting on november 5th and you don't know where you if you're not you know if you're not voting on november, november 5th then you know then you're not believing in the future of what we're what we're holding right I agree with that, Echo. And check out this chart, guys, kind of backing up and confirming what Johnny and Echo had to say. The global landscape of crypto regulation here in 2024, we've got the United States currently processing or initiating the process of crypto regulation. We got Canada doing the same, but these countries have already regulated digital assets. The European Union, United Kingdom, Hong Kong, Japan, United Arab Emirates, Australia, Bahamas, Cayman Islands, and South Africa. Russia is currently under a partial ban. We've got China which has completely banned cryptocurrencies, even though they control 51% of the hash rate for Bitcoin. They've banned, Bitcoin, they've banned cryptocurrencies, Johnny. And I just find that whole thing to be so funny. You know what's but, interesting about that chart that you show? Go back to yep. that chart. The th interesting thing is it shows the US and Canada and green and like in the process. But the problem with this thing is it's been like that for five years. That's the freaking problem. It True. shouldn't be green for that long. That shit should have already been done. There should be a check mark on that son of a bitch. Instead, we're sitting here in green and we're just circling, chasing our tail, waiting to finally do regulation. We can't get our shit together. It's been five years we've been talking about. I remember when we started this show, they were passing around regulation to Congress. We're like, oh, yeah, it's going to come out next month. It doesn't come out the five months. That was four years ago. We're still waiting for that son of a bitch to come out. What? What's taking so long? Right? So that's the problem with that chart is we are falling way behind. It shouldn't show us in green. It should show us in yellow or orange because we are we are nowhere. We're, we're just not there yet. It's terrible. Terrible. Well, Echo, the reality here is that when digital assets become regulated, there's going to be a certain set of these assets that are utilized by governments, by central banks, by traditional financial firms. And I think this next article kind of gives our listeners some insight into this. 
We already got 2,588 live listeners here joining us. Show us some love. Smash that like button, especially if you're enjoying today's episode. This October, the 2024 World Economic Document was released on digital asset regulation, and it highlighted some key contributors shaping the future of the regulatory clarity across these jurisdictions. There was only five crypto projects included in this paper. That is Ripple, Stellar, Hedera, Casper, and Avalanche. And anybody who watches this show knows we talk about a lot of these projects very often. The quote-unquote winners of this crypto cycle will be those compliant with regulation as they are poised to see the most growth and value. As shown here, the World Economic Forum is actively identifying companies that are operating with regulation in mind. These players are not only compliant, but are also engaged in high-level discussions with the World Economic Forum. That's what I've been focused on for a long time. When I first came into this asset class, I was a Bitcoin person. I was very excited about Bitcoin. Take over the banks, the financial system. Then I heard about Ethereum. Then I heard about the free pass. Then I found out about XRP. So that's just kind of like my short-term mindset there. But I think articles like this are so important because there's only a handful of companies that are even working with regulators right now. Ripple's doing it in the US. Ripple's doing it in the EU. And they're actually doing it in conglomerates like the World Economic Forum. So I did want to get your initial reaction to that. What do you think that could mean from a regulatory standpoint? Uh, if I can just throw one last thing in here too. When we talk about Stellar, Stellar is currently being utilized in Ukraine to give people instant access to funds. And I've got a video corresponding to that, Echo, but there's only a couple of companies, and I'm referring to Ripple, Stellar, and Hedera, that are being utilized right now for real-world use cases by governments. So I think that's very interesting to just put out there. Chainlink is another one that really catches my attention, but I'd love to kick it over to you, and then we'll go to Johnny. Yeah, I mean, it, it almost, um, it's coincidental, right, that you name off those four uh, crypto, pr or, you know, companies, right? Because it sounds like a kind of like an ISO, you know, compliant, <laughs> even though there's really no real ISO compliant cryptocurrencies, right? But, you know, it's been, it's been, you know, we've been talking about it and saying this all along, right? There, there is a new digital revolution that's happening in the background. Whether we like it or not, I know people are sensitive over the subject about the World Economic Forum, but that's something that we can't change, right? So you might, my, my whole theory is, okay, well, if you don't learn to adopt it with the technology, utilize the technology, you're going to get left behind. It's going to be similar to like, you know, how my mom, she, you know, learning how to use a smartphone right now, right? She really, you know, it, 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 it's sad to think about it in that way, but that's the straight reality and truth of it, right? Um, but, you know, you see these other, uh, you know, World Economic Forum, IMF and whatnot, they're actually putting, you know, they're setting forth these regulations or testing out these solutions, right? Because at the end of the day, the solution was always going back to everything that happened back in 2008, that market crash, right, that we had, right? So in the wake of that, we are coming into, you know, the new digital revolution that's supposed to help uprise this whole entire financial infrastructure that we have. It's not necessarily saying that we're getting rid of things, it's more so like, hey, we're upgrading the whole entire financial institution. And whether or not Bitcoin or these other cryptocurrencies, you know, remain, you know, are will, if they survive, it remains to be seen, right? But as far as for Ripple, Hedera, Hashgraph, you know, Casper and Stellar, all of those, right? Algorand, you we already know they're playing a massive, massive role in shifting this whole entire global financial infrastructure, all being done behind the scenes. So, you know, people like ourselves that are actually doing the conducting research, right? And, you know, putting our and hedging our bets, hedging, hedging our bets in our future to knowing, hey, this is about to happen, right? It's like getting into Amazon when it first started. <laughs> but when it was being built in a garage. So that's what Johnny Crypto did, guys. And we can learn. Some people have to touch the stove. Some people can watch other, others burn their hand in the fire. We're trying to touch the stove for our listeners, Echo. And I think this is pretty exciting because you mentioned Algorand as well. There's a very good article that we're going to take our listeners through where Algorand, Stellar, and Ripple will all be a part of the Euro Ledger, which is currently being developed today. And this is an article that came out on October 7th that our listeners are going to find very interesting. But what did he mention, Johnny? The fact that real companies are starting to use blockchain for real world use cases. We're still in an environment where this entire asset class is unregulated, but I know you like data. You're an engineer, you like data, and I have something that you're going to find super interesting. Just give me one moment to pull it up in the background. What we have is a new illustration showing the uh, development and adoption. Oh, I apologize for this, guys. Usually I'm better than this at finding my stats here. But what I had in the background was a chart kind of illustrating the adoption of digital assets. And it highlights that it's growing not only faster than the internet, but we're at 550 million users here in 2024. They believe and anticipate we're going to surpass 1 billion users by the end of 2025. That's in the next 14 months alone. They anticipate we're going to double the usage of digital assets when it comes to ownership. 
Here's my prediction, and I'd like to get your thoughts on this, Johnny. Where are those people going to come from? China. I think when China unbans cryptocurrency during this bull run, which is going to be a huge catalyst, that's when we're going to see things double. And it could be an indicator that we're actually peaking out in market value. But while I pull up those stats in the background, what do you think? Yeah, so you have to separate the people investing and in playing in crypto like we are doing versus companies that are building blockchain technologies and trying to deploy them into the world and trying to get adoption. And so that's where regulation is critical for, for people like us and people are going to continue to come. So, so the adoption, it, we have to be very clear when we say adoption, what we're talking about, we're we talking about adoption, meaning people like us investing in crypto and, and trading coins and playing, or are we talking about adoption of the technology that runs the world? Two very different things, right? Two very, very different things. So when you talk about adoption in terms of people playing in crypto space, we're seeing that grow. And you're absolutely right. 100% agree with you. <laughs> if China unlocks, you know, the door, you're going to see a flood of money coming into this space. Uh, that'll be one of the spaces. But one of the things nobody really talks about that's the biggest drivers of liquidity into this space, other than the government pumping money, has been VCs. Venture capitalists pump so much money into this stuff, all right? They're the guys behind all this stuff, driving it because they, you know, they get in low, they have all the money, then they get all the news out and they pump everything up. So it's the VCs you want to keep an eye on. They will also be liquidity drivers for this space apps. But, uh, but man, keep an eye on China. If China unlocks it, that will be massive. No question about it. We may not even have to wait for China because we're already seeing the U.S. kind of unlock access to a lot of these digital assets. And the title of today's episode was in regards to an XRP ETF, as well as the Palu news, uh, news from this morning. I'll start off with the ETF news because I think a lot of our listeners are going to appreciate this. We saw it for the first time last week, and it was Bitwise who filed an XRP ETF S1 form with the SEC. Big question here, Echo. Are they going to approve the form? That's a whole separate conversation. But we're already seeing other companies follow suit. As Canary Capital follows Bitwise in a filing for a spot XRP ETF inside the United States, crypto investment firm Canary Capital filed to create a spot XRP ETF, the second issuer to bid for an XRP ETF, uh, ETF fund in the last seven days. In an October 8th filing with the SEC, Canary Capital said its ETF would give investors access to XRP through a traditional brokerage account with the potential barriers to entry or risk involved with acquiring XRP and holding it directly. Canary said that its XRP ETF would track the price using the Chicago Mercantile Exchange CF Ripple Index, a real-time price benchmark for this product. The fund said it would avoid using any derivatives products to track the value of XRP, saying that this could subject their product to additional counterparty and credit risks. The Canary Capital did not disclose who the custodian of the XRP ETF would be, nor did it clarify what the ticker fund would be if it was listed. This is following the move from Bitwise, which we saw on October 2nd. And if I can tie this in really briefly to the article that we started off the show with, Echo, it was actually the video of Brad Garlinghouse explaining that he thinks an XRP ETF was inevitable six months ago, but he talked about baskets of these currencies being launched. So right now we're seeing the XRP aspect of this, what you know, spot derivatives products directly. What I think we're going to see eventually is digital asset funds that are 20% Bitcoin, 10% Ethereum, 10% XRP, and so on and so forth. And those are going to be in everyone's 4OK all across the nation by the end of 2026. That is when that new institutional capital will come in. And a lot of these projects that are $30 billion in market cap, like an XRP, for example, will be $120 billion, $180 billion, just based off those retirement accounts volume alone. So this is huge in the long run. It's not going to push the price chart in the next two weeks. That's not the idea here. First, we got to get this approved. We got to get it linked to people's accounts. And we also need the demand for these products which comes through a process of education. People need to understand what altcoins are before they want exposure to these assets that go. But I think it's a great sign for the entire industry. What's your initial, initial reaction to the second filing this week? Uh, mute button, Echo. There my we go. apologies, my apologies. <laughs> no, I was super excited. I, whenever I heard about it, I was like, man, this is just more, just, just more, get more so solidification that you know there is going to be increased liquidity inside of the market right you know that institutions do want access to xrp right because a lot of people were sitting there saying especially during like you know during the bear market or you know whatnot that you know institutions are not going to be using xrp banks are not going to be using xrp and look at where we're at right now right xrp is not security 
you know, whether or not, you know, the uh, SEC, uh, if they finish up or the SEC wrapped up the uh, litigation with Ripple, it doesn't defy the fact that uh, XRP itself is not an ET or it's not a security and they can approve that ETF without having, you know, without having to hold up of everything else. All of these institutions, everything around the world is going to be able to give a great wider access to this whole entire larger basket of what I feel like is going to be a new asset class, right? It's going to be more, just like you mentioned, more institutions, more 401ks, IRAs, all of that is going to be able to get exposure to the whole entire crypto landscape, especially when it comes to the XRP ledger. And that will actually build more growth in the XRP ledger because what is the XRP ledger mainly built off of? It's built off of payments, right? So if you're trying to change the whole entire global monetary system when it comes to the money and how it transacts, Right. Then we have to have something like an ETF to give more exposure for the actual institution. So I'm overall thrilled and happy for it. You know, I just hope that they approve it sooner than later. Agree with that, guys. And there's only a couple of uh, blockchains that continue to come up. And this is a great insight here. Ripple, Stellar, Hedera and Algorand are the next blue chips. I think it's a possibility. I really do. And you talk about it from a regulation standpoint. But, Johnny, I want to tie this news in as well. So, first of all, we got the second XRP ETF filed, and that was a huge deal. But this is more breaking news this morning. Palu launches a blockchain pl platform enabling savings bonds and is partnering with Ripple to create a dollar peg stablecoin for citizens. Palu had a joint project with Ripple to launch a U.S. dollar peg stablecoin since 2021. And this is the actual illustration here where you can take these connection points and replace them with a blockchain that Ripple would utilize, like an XRP, for example. I'm going to read a couple of details and I'll kick it over to you. Because of this prototype is complete, the public has demonstrated the system and has actually been using it starting today. The Palu Finance Ministry has to finalize bond issuance criteria and receive government approval. Then the 18,000 Palu citizens will be able to buy the bonds from the ministry using the apps on their phone. Palu, which consists of more than 340 islands in the South Pacific, uses the United States dollar as its currency and had no previous uh, bond on the platform. And this is the illustration that was published within the article. The Polkadot decentralized exchange operates on Sora for now. And here's what's really interesting. Palu has a joint project with Ripple, which launched back in 2021. After the project's first phase was declared a success at the end of 2022, it progressed into the second phase a year later. Palu and Cryptic Labs have developed a root name system early in 2022, which is based on the country's digital residency program. The RNS provides a blockchain-based ID with know your customer verification as a non-fungible token. And that program launched on the BNB chain in June of 2022. So Palu is basically just a testing grounds globally for a lot of these technologies, Johnny. And, you know, the, the most important thing here is that regardless if the United States decides to regulate these assets or not, this is a primary example of how they're going to be utilized. Other countries are moving into this space and Palu, a very small jurisdiction, 340 islands, 18,000 people, but they do use the U.S. dollar as their primary currency. So that's a really interesting aspect of this whole thing. What's your reaction here? Well, the thing, you know, it was interesting when I, I was excited because when I heard about Palu four years ago, they were one of the first, you know, small era countries that agreed to do a, a trial, if you will, with the Ripple technology to understand its cross-border payment solution, how it worked. They, they were one of the first uh, adopters and that started in 2021. That's when I tell everybody that we're nowhere near you know, utility, which everyone wants. Oh, we're near utility. The reality is, look, they started this in 2021 and we're now they're just starting to potentially get some of this working. Utility takes a long time to build. But the cool thing is it starts with you first trialing it out. If you like what you see, then you build it. And that's what you're seeing happen now. That's very, very encouraging for the Ripple technology, uh, the, the XRP Ledger technology. Now the question is we want to see that continue in other countries. And that's that's the part that right now we haven't seen yet that we're waiting for, right? And where are these other areas? Now we know that they're working with the, the dollar projects and all these other different ripples got their hands in the, tied in everywhere, which is great. But this is the kind of news that personally for me gets me excited because now you're seeing trials turn into real world adoption, which are going to solve real world use cases. That's very, very critical. Very important. It's good news. This is a great dead that was put out by Anders Echo. And I want to get your opinion on this. We're also going to get into that video that came out last night where the HBO documentary revealed who Satoshi was. And I'll give the listeners a little bit of insight. Peter Todd is the man's name. So we're going to be discussing that later in the episode. But Anders put this out on Twitter, so I want to break this down as well. The market is clearly preparing for XRP ETFs. On September 12th, we saw Grayscale open an XRP trust, which is likely to lead to an XRP ETF. On October 2nd, Bitwise had the first filing. On October 8th, 
Canary had the second XRP filing. The upcoming Ripple Swell event on October 15th and 16th, the official media member Eric Balanchunas from Bloomberg is there, who's an ETF analyst. Also, Johnny, we went through some of these people who are going to be not only attending the event, but speaking. We've got Grayscale, BNY Mellon, some really, really prominent ETF issuers attending the event. We can also look back a few months ago when BlackRock's Larry Fink was asked about a potential XRP ETF on Fox News, and he simply said he can't talk about it. Um, Brad Garlinghouse was also asked about an XRP ETF on another occasion where he declined to comment as well. So a lot of suspicious activity about this potential XRP ETF, it seems, but it's clearly in the plans, in my opinion. It also appears that they don't really care about the appeal from the SEC. And I think Echo hinted at this earlier. That's because the SEC can't change their stance on whether XRP is or is not a security. So these filings, I mean, who cares if Ripple pays $325 million or $125 million, right? It doesn't actually matter when it comes to approving these assets. And because they had to approve Bitcoin, they lost in court. They had to approve Ethereum because they didn't have a legitimate argument. I think the same thing is going to be applied here to XRP. And you can throw a couple of others, Solana, AVAX, Chainlink, some of these other blockchains. We're all going to have ETFs starting at the you know mid-2025, I would assume. But Echo, I did just want to get some of your thoughts on that thread, and then we'll continue with our next article. Ooh. Uh, mute button, Echo. I'm not echoing anywhere right now. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, I, I mean, I mean, it's interesting when you think about like the timing of everything, right? Um, and I always say that timing is everything when it comes to not just the market, right, but everything in general. You know, um, the, the, these big players they're playing these big moves right now, and they. If we're, you know, I understand that, you know, we want to try to have real, real time, real utilization for the network, right? And building these new infrastructures onto here and bringing in all these institutions. You know, real world assets are something that, you know, we, I would love to actually speak about here soon, uh, just because of the simple fact that, you know, that's what's going to change this whole entire landscape. Everybody wants to talk about where's all the money coming from? Well, it's not just going to come from the institution, not just going to come from the ETF. It's going to come from these real world assets because these real world assets that are going to be minted on these blockchains, which are actually being done right now. At as we speak, that's going to bring in more liquidity, right? That's going to unlock all this decentralized finance institution, whatnot coming in. So, you know, it's very interesting to see that, you know, the timing of everything and how it's coming down. And in my opinion, right, 2025 is going to be a very, very massive year, not just for, you know, the because of the presidential election that we have going on here, but we also have regulation coming in. You know, we're at the cusp when it comes to, you're looking at any market all across the board where you're talking about, cryptocurrency market, the real estate market, right? You know, the precious metal market, you know, automobile market. It Something has to either crack or something has to change. And this is where we're at right now. We're actually at the best, in my opinion, we're, we're living through the greatest time in human history. We have a huge opportunity to make money and just be, it, all we have to really do is just be patient, have a couple of bets here. If one or two of them works out, that's how generational wealth was made during the internet bubble. I think there's going to be more money entering the blockchain space than the internet bubble. That's just, that's actually, I don't think, I know for a fact, there's going to be more money entering the crypto space. So that gives us a greater opportunity to make money. But here's something I wanted to tie in what you had to say, because we're going to talk about real world assets and tokenized funds. This morning, we got breaking news that Asserta and Archak's partner to offer a tokenized fund in the United Kingdom. The UK based investors will gain exposure to regulated access to 91 tokenized funds, including those from Arbitrin, which manages $506 billion dollars in assets. Yes, I read that correctly. $500 billion we're talking about, guys. And what's really interesting here is that this is built on Hedera. So I'm just going to read one sentence for all of our HBAR investors out there. In 2023, Archax, a UK FCA regulated digital asset business, started to offer tokenized investors, uh, sorry, investments in Arbitrum's money market fund using technology by Hedera Hashgraph. So dispelled all the rumors right there, providing only facts this morning, Echo. You wanted to talk about real world assets. There's a few blockchains that come to mind. HBAR, Chainlink, and XRP. And we're going to play one 45 second video very quickly. Then we're going to kick it straight to Echo. This is the chairman, sorry, the co-founder of Chainlink discussing how tokenization is going to change the game with Bloomberg. There is another trend of real world asset tokenization where banks uh, are basically going to do another wave of securitization, but now it's going to be called tokenization. And the massive amount of things that can be tokenized extends from their core business of money market funds, interest bearing assets to the more cutting edge things like carbon credits, real estate, private equity tokenization. So really, uh, I think the offering of 
already existing cryptocurrency products in a legally compliant wrapper is meeting current client demand because they understand what cryptocurrency is. And the next stage is not for asset managers and banks to simply repackage existing cryptocurrencies, but to make their own tokens. There is another trend. Echo, I'm going to kick it straight to you. Floor is yours. I mean, he, he, I, I, I'm not going to lie to y'all. I, I do I do love Chainlink, right? Because whenever you're talking about, you know, real world tokenization and bringing over to the infrastructure of what Chainlink is actually doing, right? And bringing from the Oracle side of things, right? To the blockchain. You know, you're bringing everything from, from Web 2 over to Web 3, right? Or you can even talk about Web 5, right? Because I know Web 5 is something right around the corner. But the realization is that real world asset tokenization is happening right now as we speak. Whether you're talking about precious metal, you're talking about gold, you're talking about tokenized funds, tokenized bonds, it's all happening all behind the scenes, right? This is why I'm not surprised whenever you brought up the everything going on with Archic, which at the end of the day too, Archic is also a partner of Ripple, right? People, pe people have to remember that they're all working together to bring in this new digital, you know, landscape, this new digital revolution that we are, that we're all, you know, we're holding on to these assets, right? Um, so, in my opinion, this is going, this is going to bring, you know, more clarity, more transparency, right? And uh, overall, a much more secure ecosystem once we actually go into it. Johnny Crypto, I'd love to get some of your thoughts this morning because one of the things that people are paying attention to right now is which blockchains are going to be successful. Pretty soon, it's going to be that line in the sand where you're not early anymore, you're late. For the time being, we can claim that we're early to this asset class. And historically, October is when the bull run begins. When we talk about it, I think me and you talked about this on the phone last night. The third week of October last year in 2023, that's when Bitcoin went from $20,000 to $27,000. From that point forward until the end of March, we went from $20,000 Bitcoin all the way to $73,000. If we see something similar this time around, you're talking about Bitcoin potentially breaking its all-time high in, in early November. If we trend up at the same rate, we could. We I, I know it's a bold prediction. That's why I'm like almost caught up on myself. I genuinely believe we could see an eighty-eight to eighty-five thousand dollar Bitcoin by the end of 2024. So I don't think that's a bold proclamation, but I did want to hear some of your thoughts. We'll get into our next article. Well, Abs, I'm not going to get into like predicting how high we're going to go because we're not going to be right. It's going to be wrong, right? We all know we're going up. Here's the thing: is first of all. It's not October, Abs. Get it right. It's October. We are in the month of October. I have it marked in my calendar right here. I got all this stuff on there, so I'm not going to show my calendar, but I've got it right there on the 19th and 20th. I got those two dates circled because that's when typically you'll see things shifting historically. Now, doesn't mean it's going to happen, but you know, based on a lot of the things in the research I'm doing and, and some of the things I subscribe to. There's a lot of indicators that somewhere around the 19th or 20th, I even got it on my calendar, crypto turns bullish. So I think we're going to bottom out around that time period. And then the last week or two, maybe we start to finally see things happening in the uptrend. Uh, but, you know, so we'll wait and see, you know, but at the end of the day, I never get hung up. You know, I'll tell everybody this, like, don't get hung up on on the historics, what happened in the past, because every year is different. Every every situation is different. You know, we've got an interesting election coming up. The outcome of that election is going to have a very potential interesting impact on this in the in the long run. Um, we're in a different, uh, what do you call it, economic cycle. You know, we've never had interest rates this high before, ever, throughout any of the years in the bull run. So we're, we're just, everything's different. But, but nonetheless, you know, I like what you said earlier because it's so true. We say it all the time in the show. We are in so early. I understand, guys, it feels like you're late. And you're all waiting to become crypto millionaires. And so it sucks to have to wait. But the reality is, man, there were so many crypto internet million, uh, I mean, internet millionaires made in the 1990s, late 90s to, to the 2000s abs in that four year period from 97 to 2001. If you were just patient and you waited and you weren't like me and you, my exit plan was horrible. I had a hundred percent exit plan. I sold all my Amazon. If I wasn't an idiot and I held some of my Amazon, if I had a Merlin back then, like we have today. I would have probably only sold half and I, I probably wouldn't know you because I'd be a multi multi millionaire, right? So that, I think that time, that opportunity is coming again. There's one more chance, at least for me, to kind of make up for my mistake uh, and for everybody to learn from that so you guys don't make the same mistake. Just be ready. Have your exit plans ready. Abs, you don't want to be trying to make an exit plan when things are pumping. Trust me. Your way, that's too late. You don't want to be trying to figure out your plan when you're falling out of the plane, right? You got to have the plan made before you get on the plane. So I hope everybody is doing that. I hope people are thinking about 
okay, when this thing starts happening, what am I going to do? How am I going to exit? Because if you don't exit abs, I mean, we know we are still in speculation. And so these things are going to go up and they're going to come down. We're, we're nowhere near full-blown utility yet. And so it's going to be a while before we stabilize and get that nice, beautiful S-curve that comes with, with full-blown utility. So you got to take advantage of these opportunities. I'm excited. I agree with Echo. 2025, I think, is going to be an extremely exciting year for crypto. And it's cool because we talk about the internet bubble echo, but we're going to be talking about the crypto money pretty soon. They call them the internet bubble millionaires and billionaires like a Mark Cuban. There's going to be a lot of those that come from the crypto space as well. And one of the things I did want to ask you about is what we're already seeing right now is Mika global regulation coming into effect for this digital asset class. Coinbase plans to delist non-compliant stable coins starting December 30th, 2024. We've seen uphold uh, make some amendments when it comes to Tether. We've seen Kraken make some amendments. There's another one. I believe it's BitTrue. But that one's a guess. So if we're going to see all these major, major platforms delist Tether, they're not going to have the open access. They're not going to have the daily volume. And of course, Ripple is launching what I'll call a competitor with RLUSD. That's going to be full, fully regulated, fully audited, and fully backed from what we can understand with transparent rules on the ledger. I'd like to get some of your thoughts. What do you think about, first of all, Mika coming into effect, as long with Ripple launching a stable coin at the same time? <laughs> so coincidental, right? <laughs> um, no, to, to be honest with you, I think that because the U.S. itself, we're not coming out with regulations, right? This is what we were talking about earlier. So somebody had to do it. And I'm happy that the EU is actually putting forth some type of regulation because we can't just be printing money out of thin air, out of nowhere, right? Um, so Mika regulations, they have all these different criteria for people that don't know, right? Similar to like Basel three, where they have with, with, the, B, with the BIS and uh, in all the banks, right? Um, the, or the EU keep created these regulations that all of these stable coins have to uh, abide by. One of them that in particular I want to point out is the is, is being exposed to the tier one asset, the new tier one asset class of gold, right? So you have to have a backing of gold, which if people don't know, back in 1971, the US dollar was taken off of the gold standard. So that is a big piece of the puzzle right there that a lot of people aren't paying attention to. And this is one of the reasons why like gold is actually moving as fast as it is. I believe it's almost 30, you know, 30, 30% year to date right now. So, it, you know, with that being said, because a lot of these stable coins are coming in, they're going to be backed by a lot of these real world assets and, a, and dollar equivalents, right? And RLUSD, Ripple has made it known that it's not only going to be backed by, you know, US dollars, but all of these real world assets as well, baskets of them. So in my opinion, it couldn't have come at a better timing because, hey, if the US ain't going to do it, somebody's going to do it because we got to go. We, <laughs> I'm tired. I'm tired. I want, I want regulations to come in. Right. Everybody wants to be crypto millionaires. Well, hey, go ahead and make sure you're voting on November 5th. If you're not, then you're part of the problem, yo. Well, it's like Elon Musk said, get everybody to register, get everybody to vote, because that's we only get a, a chance every four years to actually make some change here. Another thing, Johnny, is it's actually more important to figure out where you spend your money. You can hold that sticky note because the reality hold it up to the camera, because the reality is there's only a handful of these people who are actually being pro crypto and speaking out right now. I think in the next six months, we're going to see almost half the congressmen, half the senators become pro crypto. We even had Maxine Waters make some pro crypto statements, but look at this data. Polls show that the vast majority of Americans don't trust crypto. And this is from somebody who's a counter argument here. I'll provide the other end of this. Only 7% of Americans had crypto in 2023. At the end of 2023, it was reported that less than 7% of Americans own crypto because there was less than 20 million active crypto owners in America. Well, that number has more than doubled here in 2024. We are up to 52 million crypto investors in America alone. 16 million are in swing states, Johnny. So believe it or not, crypto and how these presidential candidates interact with this asset class could determine the actual election. These elections were only determined by a few hundred thousand votes historically. Hillary Clinton won the populist, guys. Just want to throw that out there. So it's like there's these elections are much more confusing than people would like to admit. Most of these states are set in stone. So it's a very thin margin we're working with. I do want to get your thoughts. There's only seven. The seven states that matter. Like if you don't live in those seven states, like my state don't matter. <laughs> it's so blue. It doesn't matter what I vote for. Right. So, 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 well, for the locals, it always matters just to be clear. But anyway, Abs, I want to get back to something you said this morning. So he's not wrong. The guy there where he talks about, where he talks about, um, you know, that most of people in America think crypto is bad and a scam. He's, he's, he's actually right about that. Most Americans still believe that. That's why I'm excited. That's the whole reason why I'm excited to be invested in this space, because most people think it's a scam. They're not here yet. Once everybody's here, 
Who do you think is going to drive the price up? How's the price going to go up if everybody's here? <laughs> I mean, that's how it works. I don't think I understand people understand how the market works. It's just money comes in, money comes out. You need people there to put money in or it ain't going up. Okay. And so the reality is the more that people think it's a scam and they aren't here yet, the more I'm, I'm buying and loading up in my positions that I believe are real world solves that are going to be here in the long run. Because at some point, just like in 1997, when abs, I wish you were born where you were, you were in diapers. But when you were in diapers running around with a little pacifier, right? What was happening was there were a lot of people saying the internet's a scam. It'll never survive. It's only good for nefarious activities and this and that. Like that's what they said, right? Now look at us today. Not a single one of you can live without the internet. You just can't. If I took your internet away right now, tell me your life wouldn't change, right? So that's just how wrong they were. They were so wrong and so off about the whole thing. Weren't even close about getting it right, right? Same thing's happening here with with crypto. Same thing in blockchains. They will be here. They will be the future. They will drive things up. But we have to get there, right? We have to get past this part of this whole, people don't like change, right? So, So they have to feel good. And the TV has to tell them what to feel good about. So when the TV starts telling them, crypto's great for you, it's all good. And everybody, that's when everybody's going to pile in on this thing. And then it's going to be too late. If you weren't in, it's too late. Sorry, you missed the boat. And now you have to get precise on what you want to invest in and hope you nail it and then hold for a long term for it to happen. So that guy is right. Most of America still, I would say, you know, what will we say? About 20% are invested in crypto, right? Yep. Or at least, you know, from both. So this 80% that think it's a scam. I mean, I talked to most of my friends and family, and because we're close to it, they know it. But you talk to their friends, they have no clue what crypto is still. They don't. And that's actually a good thing if you want to get in this game early. But I think in the next few years, that's going to start to change dramatically, and then it's going to be too late. Out. But we still have, a, I think, a year or two before we start to really see a shift. But I think that will also depend on which administration wins and how hard they push this. Look at my camera. It's retarded. Uh, and how and how how hard they push this thing and how hard – you know, how, how quickly the, the big boys who have decided, you know, that they want to wrap their hands around this have decided they're ready to roll with it. The minute that decision is made, you will see this, this space take off dramatically. Echo, I do want to kick it over to you because we're talking a lot about, you know, the long-term decisions that are being made in this space. And this is something I saw yesterday that I think just kind of highlights how early we are once again. The U.S. government could be dumping $4.38 billion worth of seized Bitcoin. The U.S. Supreme Court has declined to review a case regarding 69,000 Bitcoin valued at about $4.4 billion seized from the Silk Road marketplace. Battle Born Investments had claimed the rights of the Bitcoin through its bankruptcy estate and had its appeal rejected after failing to convince the lower courts of its claim. The Supreme Court's refusal to hear this case clears the U.S. government to sell this stack of Bitcoin. And I'm not really concerned about $4 billion being dumped into the market. Yeah, it might be frustrating for a couple of days, five days, something like that. But the reality is, I think a lot of people are, the people who understand this technology understand we're in a debt crisis. And, and if I could just kick it over to you to kind of go on your, your diatrop here, because you know so much about this stuff. I watch a lot of your content. You had a great 20 minute video that you put out the other day on your X account. And you talked about your cartoon book within that video. So I thought that was pretty cool. But the whole idea here is that America is in a debt crisis. And what we need is not more money to be printed. We need a hard back digital asset class, a solution to the crisis that we're in. That's why Trump will make the jokes like, maybe we'll use Bitcoin to to reduce or get rid of our national debt. That's because a product like Bitcoin, which is 100% finite, is weighted against the US dollar. So you can apply that narrative to any asset class that's definitively finite, right? If there's 1 million or 100 billion, it doesn't really matter. As long as it's a finite asset class. Gold's not finite. Fiat's not finite. Nothing in the natural world is actually 100% finite. Not to say that word a thousand times, but that's why Bitcoin was such a big deal when it initially came out. Ripple, when they launched, you know, originally as OpenCoin back in 2004, the idea was much of the same. Finite asset class valued against the US dollar that increases the utility of the asset. I think RLUSD is a great illustration of this, but just leveraging the XRPL is another great example of it being a solution for a debt crisis. Maybe you can just talk about whatever you find interesting, the $35 trillion in debt, where blockchain fits into this, and some of the things you found down the rabbit hole. Yeah, most definitely. So uh, predominantly, I cover about the uh, U.S. debt clock, right? And I've been doing it for over a year now. Um, and the U.S. national debt has just been exploding. I mean, we're right now spending $1 trillion every single year just on interest alone. 
keep that in mind again one trillion dollars on interest alone every hundred days that goes by that adds uh a, a one trillion dollars to the u.s national debt we are paying more in interest than what we spend in the military right and when i mean me we i mean the government right and that is that for anybody that's managing that portion of our economy, obviously doesn't. For me, it doesn't make sense, right? Because there's no reason why the you know the glo the GDP ratio to income should or the, the GDP ratio to debt should be at like 123 percent. You know, I as a former mortgage banker, whenever I saw that, I was like, oh well, you know, that's equivalent to somebody trying to buy a house, right? If you're trying to buy a house. You know, you got to stay under that 50 percent debt to income ratio. How is the federal government continuing, you know, to print more money when we're at 123 percent? It doesn't make sense. Right. But that goes into a factor. What is the solution? Right. Because we can we can go ahead and raise our hands and throw up. Hey, this is the problem right here. Well, what is the solution? The solution is blockchain technology. They have been hinting at it for us for a while now on the U.S. debt clock, right? And whenever I sit there and they pop, pop up all these little secret images, I sit there and I decode it. And they've been telling us that we're going to have a basket of real world assets, right? We're going to have gold. We're going to have silver. We're going to have copper. We're going to have oil. And it's all going to be on this blockchain technology because that is the only way that it's going to be able to be secured. It's going to be able to be found efficient right transparent okay um interoperable right and, and most importantly it's the only way that we're going to be able to tap into decentralized finance on a institution on a retail and institutional level okay because that's where they said that you know dividend right especially like right where where you're pulling up right there it said you know the new treasury dollars coming in right in 2025 okay it pays in dividend in the only technology that's able to do that to register real world assets and to be able to tap into that is this new treasury dollar. Now, it sounds like hopium, right? OK, well, it sounds like hopium that all of this is going to happen, but there is no other solution. You know, the only thing I can think about is, hey, this is the only way everybody wants to go back to gold and silver. Everybody wants to go back to hard assets. OK, I understand in which I agree with everybody. Right. But let's go ahead and take what we have what we had before and upgrade it, right? Okay, there's no reason why, you know, we, look, the US dollar is already down 97%, <laughs> you know, since its inception. It's already, it's already at zero in my opinion, okay? So everybody's talking about the US dollar going to zero. Well, no, it's not gonna go to zero. It's gonna, it's gonna take what we have right now and just upgrade it, right? Unfortunately, some people are gonna get hurt by that because everybody wants, a lot of people want to see the dollar go down to zero, you know, want to see it go away, right? But in real reality, we're not, you know, we're just, all we're doing is just moving from one US dollar to a new US dollar, which in our lifetime, we have never seen happen before, but has been done throughout history, right? But in this, in this time, this case scenario, this is why I say we're living through some of the greatest times in human history, is because this is the very first time in human history where we are going to be able to go back to these asset classes like gold and silver, like they did back in the days, whenever banks were to come in and actually, you know, try and take over the whole entire monetary system. And we're going to be able to use blockchain technology to leverage that and to secure our financial future and prosperity. Right. And 2025 seems like the best day, uh, the best time of all, just because of the simple fact that you have very pro administration that are coming in to, you know, that, that hopefully will be coming in to the United States, right? Um, mo most predominantly, you know, if you if people remember, Elon Musk uh, has offered to be the Department of Government Efficiency, right? The head of the Department of Efficiency, right? If that were to happen, right, I can almost see there being an overhaul of the whole entire Federal Reserve, the whole entire federal government, everything that, basically everything that what the, uh, the XRP Unleashed documentary talks about. I want to tie this into another conversation. You dropped a lot of truth bombs there. Let me tie this into the housing market as well. So back in the day, let's call it 1970, you used to come to America, you'd be able to buy a house for very cheap. Let's use a hypothetical $25,000 number. Anybody who just bought a home and held it for 40 or 50 years made a huge sum of wealth by just being patient. I think that digital assets are the exact same idea, just a different version of it with this type of an asset class. If you get into an asset like Bitcoin, like an XRP, like a Hedera, Something that's going to be here for the next few decades, patience is all it takes to really create this generational wealth. But is it, is it interesting that for the first time in America, I think the general public is aware of how the Federal Reserve operates. 
back in 2016, 2017, just five, eight years ago, people weren't even interested in this type of stuff. The system was operating. Yeah, there was some political drama. People were frustrated with the way that Trump came in and Obama left things and the way that that whole campaign went down. When you talked about America, we hadn't gone through the C-19 crisis. We weren't aware of the interest that we were paying on our debt for the most part. So I think a lot of this stuff has come to light. We also weren't dealing with much war at the time. Back in 2016, we weren't in, I mean, we were in Afghanistan. We were in some of the places located in the Middle East that we've always kind of um, set up embassies and done things of that nature. But the reality is that ever since we've seen this European war break out, and now we're on the precipice of another one in Israel, I think that we're going to see this debt crisis be exacerbated because what we're seeing right now is American citizens are struggling, but we're writing massive checks, sending that money overseas. And now because the American people understand how that process works, they're really frustrated by that idea. Why are we fixing the world? It'd be like if I was uh, homeless and my house was a disaster and I'm going over to my neighbors to help him paint his fence. It's like, focus on your house, fix your property, fix your family before you start going out and saving the world. Very simple idea, but I think it's total BS for the time being. So I did just want to get some of your thoughts on how this all ties in. Where does blockchain fit into this whole global narrative? I mean, it, it solved a lot of problems, right? It solved a lot of problems that we have right now, especially in the um, in the uh, Federal Reserve and federal government, right? Uh, because, you know, the reason why I'm a little choked up by it is because I'm only live a few hours away from uh, Asheville, uh, North Carolina, which is uh, where everything happened from the, you know, Hurricane Helene, right? And, you know, there are people out there that are, you know, legitimately, you know, suffering, right? And everything that the federal government is doing right now and how they're claiming to step in, right? You know, with $750, you know, from FEMA and whatnot, you know, that, that that's nothing compared to what is actually being sent on over to the, to, on the other side, right? If we had more transparency, right, we'd probably trust our government, right? We'll probably trust the people that are in office. But then I don't, you know, because then, you know, you go around, you know, instead of helping the people that really need help that you're supposed to be supporting that we supposedly vote y'all in, right? Y'all are supposed to be helping us, but no, y'all are helping other people uh, in other countries, right? How are we supposed to survive, right? We're the ones paying y'all's bills, right? That's how I, that's how I figure it. But at the end of the day, if they're not going to do it, then we will. You know, eventually people like us, you, me, everybody else, we'll just get tired of it because we have the technology at our fingertips. Everything is open source that we're just going to pop up and say, okay, well, chat GPT, figure out how to freaking make me, uh, make me a smart contract. Bada bing, bada boom. Create that right then and there. Why do we need somebody in the middle at that point? That's very much agree. And that's why I think Ripple's actually being combat by the SEC in court. Right now, JP Morgan, Bank of America, Fidelity. Okay, listen to this stat, Echo. Of the five largest banks inside the United States, every single one of the five largest banks has $50 trillion, $50 trillion with a T in derivatives circulating in the capital market. So people are like, why are why is the SEC going after Ripple? I don't know, maybe because there's a monopoly on global payments right now and Ripple's going to disrupt that. Seems really, really simple when you think about it in that context, but already Elizabeth Warren, she's being countered in Massachusetts with John Deaton. And if John Deaton wins, in Massachusetts, starting this November, just to shift gears very slightly, that's a symbolic change for America as well. I genuinely believe this because Elizabeth Warren has been such a strong proponent of being anti-crypto, communicating with the Federal Reserve. In 2021, she proposed a bill that would make central bank digital currencies legal. And she actually proposed a bill that would make self-custody illegal. So these are proposed, obviously never approved. But the idea here is that there are certain people in the room who are pro-crypto and there are other people in the room who are anti-crypto. And the longer this game goes on, the more the anti-crypto are being exposed as the ones who control the monopoly on payments today. So I just wanted to throw that out there, guys. We only got a couple of minutes left. Johnny Crypto, I know your camera's malfunctioning, so I'll need some form of communication if you want to chime in. Just throw your finger up or give me a message, whatever you'd like to do. But Echo, I'm going to kick it over to you and then we'll continue. Hey, Abs, you know, the, the reality is I have to run, so I'm going to drop off now and say goodbye. I love you guys. Uh, Echo, it was great seeing you, brother. Your website looks awesome. If people haven't visited his website, go check it out. And Abs, I'm sure you're going to tell everybody where they can get an exit plan later. So I got to grow. Love you guys, and I'll see you in the next one. Thank you, Johnny. We appreciate you, and we love you too, man. And Echo, if we are going to tie this whole thing back to what, you know, the original diatribe that we went on, is that the the United States, and I would say the world, is going through a debt crisis, and we're also going through a de-dollarization process. And so our job, and I think a lot of your research kind of exposes what crypto's role is in the new financial system and which blockchains you find to be most pivotal. 
What are some of the connections that you found? And this doesn't have to be because it's not Conspiracy Friday, guys, but I do want to hear what his conspiracies are on this topic. What have you found out about connections between blockchain companies working with private banks? When you think about what the Federal Reserve created, they created it to control the economy without letting people know they're in control. And I think that kind of whole game was exposed. But now we're seeing blockchain companies interact with them behind the scenes and not let us really know what they're doing. So I'd love to hear what you've been able to find. Yeah, most definitely. I mean, this is a great touching point because I actually just partnered up with a great company called Kinesis Network. Um, it's actually built on the Stellar Network, right? And this is actually going to give exposure to retail investors to be able to invest into digital gold and silver, right? So people that on the retail side that don't have digital or don't have gold and silver, but they want to be able to hold it digitally, they're going to be able to do so. Even better than that, right? Let's just say if you have XRP, XLM, XDC, Bitcoin, Ethereum, and you want to trade it for that digital gold and silver, you can do it on their exchange, okay? Even better than that, too, let's just say you have physical, right? Because that was my whole entire mission when I first got into this was like, hey, well, if I have physical gold and silver, I don't want to sell it. How do I utilize it on the blockchain on the retail side? Because we already hear all of these commercial or not commercial, but institutions, right? We heard about Med, right? And how they're bringing gold to the XRP ledger. We heard about, you know, everything going on with HSBC. But how do we, the retail, do it? Well, that's where I found, that's where, you know, Kinesis Network actually reached out to me and I did some research on them and I'm like, oh my goodness this is the company that i was legitimately looking for you know helping retail get into the blockchain space not only is it backed up on or built on a network right the stellar network which we all know about right um but so it's very re representable but it's already you they, they're compliant they, they they follow guidelines and they're completely transparent OK, and it's all done on the Stellar eco on the Stellar ecosystem. Now, I'm not sitting here saying that, you know, Stellar is meant for retail and uh, and XRP and XRP ledger is meant for the institutions. Right. But right now, how it's shown right now. OK, at least how the landscape is, is being shown to me is that, OK, well, you know, I have this product. Right. That's going to give be able to give people exposure to these real world assets of gold and silver. And this is all going to tie in with that whole entire new USA Treasury dollar and the new uh, RLUSD and stable coins coming in because that's what the whole entire basket is. These baskets are, you know, these real world assets are going to be backed up by, or that they're going to be backing these new, these new Treasury dollars or these new stable coins and Treasury dollars. Exactly. And we're already seeing some of these ideas be utilized overseas. This is Daniel Dixon from Stellar talking about a real world use case that's happening in Ukraine today. Stellar provides the, the rails to lead anchors like MoneyGram who convert USDC into US dollar so people can access real-time currency. I'm going to play just a little bit of this short interview and then we'll kick it over to Echo. Here we go. Is this the ultimate promise of crypto? Is this why it exists? This is why it exists. It's so interesting listening to your last segment because what this technology does is actually solve a tremendous number of problems. And what we're doing with the UNHCR and have been doing for the last year and a half now is really demonstrating that this technology has a purpose. And the aid is, uh, it gets into the hands of the refugees within three minutes of downloading the wallet and receiving the text message from the UN. Uh, and then they can cash it out at a MoneyGram location, they can hold it, they can put it in their bank account. It actually really uh, has solved a tremendous amount of problems just in terms of aid distribution. I, I just heard uh, the uh, head of the UNHCR talk yesterday about the fact that it saved them $12 million to be able to use these digital uh, components of their work. So it's a pretty great piece of technology that can be leveraged. I think an important part of this daisy chain here from going from crypto to MoneyGram to account is how the crypto is used in the form of stable coins in particular. Mm -hmm. And if you think about the way that the crypto industry is transforming, at what juncture is the stablecoin industry becoming more important than the regular way Bitcoin, Ethereum, crypto community, as we had previously talked about it? Well, you got to remember that the rails are the, the technology are the rails. And so those tokens in every one of these pieces of um, in every one of these uh, um, chains are the secret sauce sort of the way that keeps everything tight that makes sure it ensures that there's security and stability in the network. But in terms of really transacting, we've always believed that tokenization of fiat and just tokenization of real world assets is the way to sort of make this all work together. Boom. And that's what I wanted to play right there. Not only did we get access to the real world use cases that are happening now, we're seeing how they're going to tokenize fiat. They're going to tokenize treasury bonds and the underlying security here or the underlying thing that makes it all happen is the blockchain and the utility 
of a Stellar, of a Ripple, even when they're using a USDC derivative, that liquidity is being brought on chain, transferred, paying a small fee and being brought off chain. So we're going to see that more and more going forward, guys. And I do want to give a special shout out to Echo. Echo, we are going to close it out after this, but I wanted to get your opinion. Let people know where they can find you. I'll pull up your website as well. But what do you think about Stellar right now being a solution when it comes to a real world use case and identifying that the blockchain is what allows all this to take place? I think the Stellar is a great project, right? Unfortunately, I don't talk about it as much because, you know, I'm, I'm really big on the XRP army, but I do, you know, support Stellar, right? Of course, the new company that I'm partnered up with is Kinesis Network. They built on Stellar. And Stellar itself, you know, it goes through, the, it's almost similar, uh, you know, protocol that the XRP ledger, you know, is on as well, right? But again, you know, at the end of the day, we do know that real world use case is happening right now. You're going to be able to unbank, you're going to be able to bank the unbank, right? And that's what Stellar is really focused on right now. And this is what I, why I'm so passionate about Stellar and what it, what it's looking to de develop as well, right? Kinesis, whenever they reached out to me about tokenizing real world assets as far as gold and silver, right? It's just like, wow, this is something that we need on the retail side, right? Again, I love Ripple. I love XRP. But at the end of the day, we, the people, right, have to learn how to use this technology, okay? If we know that gold and silver is the backbone of, you know, or not just the backbone, but just, you know, God's money, okay, how do we get access to that on a digital landscape side, right? Because nobody's going to teach us how to do that. But there are companies in the background that's actually doing that. So, you know, when it comes to, you know, that interview that she just had, right, it, it, it's going to happen regardless. It's just, are you going to play, or, again, are you going to adopt this technology? Are you going to learn about it? Because nobody's going to hold, hold, you know, nobody's really going to hold your hand and just say, hey, go and do this. No, you're going to have to actually do it yourself, right? Hopefully, you know, there's not going to, you know, it's not going to be, I don't believe it's going to be kind of like that incident where if you're not involved in it, then you're just going to be left in the dust, right? Because I feel like that, you know, when the shift does happen, at least theoretically, whenever I'm going through my conspiracy mind on how they're going to resolve this debt, you know, crisis, that people won't just, you know, fall over dead, right? Won't, won't get left behind, but more so like, hey, you're not going to be advanced in this technology, right? Still, you're going to be safe, right? Whether you're going to get a, you know, universal basic income, if you believe in that or whatnot, it's going to happen because countries all around the world are already, you know, testing that out. Right. So in my opinion, if you're able to understand, uh, you know, take a few time, take a few minutes out of your day to actually study this technology, you'll be one step ahead of everybody else that, you know, not really paying attention. Agreed, Echo. And one of the things that we witnessed throughout our roller coaster last week was a roller coaster in the price as well. We went from 66 cents all the way down to 50 cents. And we asked our live chat today. The question that we asked our live chat is what is your peak price projection for XRP during this bull run between now and the end of 2025, 47% of our listeners voted over $8 XRP. 25% said between three and eight. 13% said below $1.25. And only 13% said between $1.25 and $3.05. I feel very comfortable stating that I think we're at least going to get to $3 here, Echo. These are fun conversations. I just wanted to get your opinion on the whole matter. I threw the XRP price chart up here to close it out. We got 5,430 people here, guys. Show us some love. Smash that like button. A special thank you to Echo for making time for us today. So Echo, to close it out on a fun topic, what do you think of the results here? And if you had to vote, what would you choose? I, I, I honestly, to be honest with you, it's going to be over $8. Right. You know, the, the suppression has been put on for seven plus years right now. Um, whenever I'm using my technical analysis, I actually use the Fibonacci retracement level. Right. And I'm tr I'm actually aiming for upper upwards of near sixteen dollars to twenty some dollars. Right. At least I want to say topping out. But, you know, it will definitely be, um, you know, if anybody's looking to take profits, which if you're not taking if you're not, you want to take profit, make sure you check out Merlin. Right. Have an exit strategy. OK. Have an exit strategy, because just like Johnny Crypto said earlier. Right. People, whenever you're going, you're whenever we go through this bull run, if you've never been through a bull run before, people are like, oh, we're going to, you know, I'm just going to hold on just a little bit, just a little bit. You know, it never, you know, it's never a shame just to take a little skim off the top. Right. You know, and for me, you know, if I'm not going to I'm not going to cash out my XRP. Right. I, I have a clear plan on what I'm going to do with it. Right. But other cryptocurrencies, I am. And I already have that extra strategy set up because then I can roll a exit into other cryptocurrencies or into real estate or into other asset classes. Right. Because at the end of the day for me. Right. is to build that nest egg because that's what everybody should be aiming for. Right. It's that whole entire nest egg of like, OK, well, I'm just not in just in one 
cryptocurrency. I'm not just in one asset class. No, I'm in a basket of asset class, right? Do exactly what the rich do, right? Do exactly what these, you know, BlackRock, Blackstone, and all of them do, right? Have a whole entire basket of assets just in case if something were to fall, right? You'll be able to rely on the other side. So, yeah. Very much agree with that echo. And I'm going to throw out one last stat as we close it out here today. If Ethereum, sorry, if XRP did an 11X in market cap today, it would still be valued at less than Ethereum. So that means that if XRP got to about $5.20 in value, it would still be less than Ethereum is worth today. That stack keeps me optimistic because it goes to show not only are huge amounts of money going to come into this market because of what Ripple's doing with CBDCs, because of what they're doing with the stablecoin, we're also seeing the XRP ETFs pass. And eventually, when we get a new change administration, we're going to see a change in leadership at the SEC. And I think America is going to become a more you know, crypto-friendly place. It couldn't be more anti-crypto, I promise you that much. So <laughs> I want to give a special shout out to Echo. Echo, where can people find your content? Your website, your YouTube channel, your Twitter, whatever you'd like to send people so they can check you out. Yeah, most definitely. So you can find me over on uh, X predominantly. That's where I spend a lot of my time. I am also on TikTok. I'm also on other you know platforms such as Rumble and YouTube as well. But predominantly, you're gonna find me. Uh, you're gonna find me over on X, right? But I did. I did launch my website successfully last week. Um, Echo the truth.com. And if you go to that website, you're gonna see that you know I revamped everything and whatnot. But also at the same time too, uh, I also uh, released what what I know of is the very first crypto, you know, comic book, right? Crypto comic ebook, right? And with that being said, uh, it's 17 pages of fully illustration from yours truly right here, right? Where I break down, you know, uh, on a simplistic level on how to buy XRP, because that's the biggest question I get. Everybody's like, how do I buy XRP? How do I do it? Right? And I was over thinking in my mind, like, okay, well, everybody's asking me this question, right? Obviously, this is something you can just Google. Okay, well, I don't want to charge somebody for just something so simple, but let me go ahead and show my creative skills into there, right? So I threw that out there, right, so that people can actually purchase it if they want to actually support me as a content creator and the person that actually is uh, creating art. Right. But also at the same time, you're going to be able to uh, be able to get a, a, a exclusive NFT drop to you as well. That's going to have exclusive perks in the future. Right. So that's actually something that I released uh, last week. So if you if you want to check that out, make sure you check that out. You know, echo the truth dot com or go over to X as well. Echo, I'm sorry. I know I said that was the last thing, but I forgot we titled this episode Satoshi's Reveal. So I just got to get your thoughts on this. Yesterday, the HBO documentary came out and supposedly Peter Todd was identified as Bitcoin's creator, Satoshi Nakamoto. I did have a brief video prepared, but let me just make this very clear. He thinks these claims are laughable. He denied these claims. And he even went as far as to post this last night. I am not Satoshi. But I want to preface, I did not watch the documentary. I didn't have time yesterday. I did see a couple of the highlights that were posted on Twitter. But Echo did watch the documentary. So I, first of all, I wanted to get your thoughts on the product overall. And what did you think about their analysis of Peter Todd being identified as Satoshi? <laughs> I, 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 look, the marketing was great. Don't get it twisted, right? The marketing was great. The hype was great. Um, but I really believe it's just all a distraction, right? Because to be honest with you, I don't really care about who 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 Satoshi Nakamoto really is. Because it did what it, it Bitcoin did exactly what it needed to do. That's it, that's all I care about, right? You know, it help it, it help bring in this new digital revolution, right? So whenever I was watching the documentary, I was like, like, man, there was no. Unfortunately, there's no storyline behind it. <laughs> it was just like, hey, we're going to try to find out who Satoshi Nakamoto is. Like, okay, well, why don't you go do my mind? My, how my mindset was, was like, why don't you go expose something more bigger and better, right? You know, that's how my mind was going. But, you know, for somebody that just wants to be entertained, I guess, you know, with the letdown at the very end, it's like, you know, you built up this whole entire emotion and it's just like, oh my goodness. <laughs> you know, you, you got the dude that literally that you claim to be the, you know, the Satoshi Nakamoto. And then he comes out on X before the documentary releases and it's just like, you know, blows the whole entire cover. It's like, OK, well, what's the use of it? So that's why, you know, I put out a post over on X letting people know, hey, there is a documentary that's coming out that me and you are both part of. Right. And it's called XRP Unleashed. Right. Shout out to Chris and Maya. For, for, from fruition production that is going to be showcased next month, okay, okay, at limited theaters, okay, and this is going to expose exactly what what this documentary from HBO was not going to do or it decided not to do, right? 
expose, you know, unveil the secret some of the secrets, I don't know if it's going to unveil all the secrets, right? But it's going to unveil a lot of secrets that, you know, are going on behind the scenes. Because, again, I don't care who Satoshi Nakamoto is, and nor should you, because Bitcoin already did what it needs to do. What do we need? What we need to expose is the corruption within our our own government, right? Our unelected bureaucrats. The reason why Ripple is being, you know, being suppressed down. So if you're not following, you know, uh, fruition production, make sure you're doing that because, you know, we're all going to be, you know, I don't know if you're going to be at the, at the, um, at one of the showing. I'll right? be in well, Boston. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Perfect, perfect. I'm going to be in Atlanta. Okay. So shout out everybody. You're going to be in Atlanta. I'm going to be out there, right? He's going to be in Boston. Um, you know, make sure y'all check it out because I mean, XRP at least I feel like it's good. it's another beast. I mean, I know some people have been, uh, you know, have been, you know, the whole entire XRP community was all like, you know, there there was some conflict go going on on that end with the uh, with the whole documentary. But when you when I was thinking about and watching this past documentary with the Bitcoin documentary, I'm like, oh my goodness, knowing what Chris and Maya what they're developing and their goal and what they were always going to do. This gonna blow this one out of the water, which is one of the main reasons why I feel like that. You know, Hollywood and HBO, you know, didn't want to, you know, rather go with the Bitcoin documentary rather than the XRP documentary. Hey, it's easier to point to something that's absolutely irrelevant, like who's this Satoshi Nakamoto character. But the thing is, I this was my big guess before they actually released the documentary this week was that they were gonna put a blank screen at the end of the episode and say, we're all Satoshi Nakamoto in our own way. So at least they put a name out there, even if it's incorrect, guys. And I want to give a special thank you to Echo for making time for us this morning. Echo, there's a lot of things that people are saying right now. People are pessimistic, right? When you talk about the XRP community, let's give a little bit of hope to end, the, end out the episode. A couple of big things we have going for us. Historically, when Bitcoin breaks its all-time high, that's when altcoins move. And Bitcoin has not broken its all-time high. Number two, historically, October is the most bullish month for Bitcoin in the crypto markets. We do 25% year over year on average in October when it comes to Bitcoin. 12% in November and 18% in December. If we follow these similar percentages, we're talking about a Bitcoin that's worth over $100,000 by the end of December. And why is that important? Because products like XRP, Solana, Hedera, whatever altcoin that our listeners are interested in, they're most likely not going to move until that moment occurs. When Bitcoin breaks its all-time high, that's when we're going to be coming on here talking about how much money we're making on our portfolios. But until that moment, we just have to be patient. So I did want to get some of your thoughts to close out the episode. Are you optimistic? And and just, it's not only about price. And I know we're focused on price, but the price is the reality of, of adoption taking place, of regulation coming forward. All we really need is a new change in administration at the SEC, some very simple stablecoin rules passed, and this market's going to explode. What's your outlook here at the end of 2024, Echo, and heading into 2025? I believe if, uh, if everybody plays their cards right on November 5th, we're going to have a very optimistic 2024 going into 2025. That is 100% for sure, right? Um, now, when it comes to every, now when it comes to all of that itself, uh, you know, I think about you know how we how we can switch up this whole entire monetary system, and you're seeing it done behind the scenes right now, right? Where we're moving from a debt based system over to a credit based system, and if we can successfully do that, which I believe we can, okay, again, as long as you play your cards right, then you know everything is going to be October. Like October is going to be a whole entire you know millennial long. It will go up. You know there was a you know Mr. Pool post that said go up and never stop. That will definitely be the case because again you're going from a debt based scenario system that we have right now and switching it to a credit based scenario to tap into real world assets and decentralized finance, which had never ever been done before, ever. So if people can understand that this is more than just the money, right? Like we're going to make money, right? But more than just the money, it's the whole entire shift in reality, the whole entire shift of everything that we, in my opinion, you know, we've been, we, a lot of things have been covered up. A lot of it's going to be unveiled, right? And the true money that has always been there for, for, for the longest time is going to be unveiled, right? And all this smoke and mirror, the, you know, dollar that we work for, right? That a lot of people work for nowadays, it, it's been nothing but an illusion, you know? I'm very hopeful for the future of, you know, cryptocurrencies, precious metals, right? I'm very hopeful for humanity, right? But at the end of the day, we do have to go out and make our voices known. And the best way to do it is November 5th. Make sure you register. Make sure you, you know, you're on the right side of history.
That's a strong way to end it, guys. And we got 5,812 live listeners here joining us. Show us some love. Smash that like button on your way out of here. I want to give a special thank you to Echo. Special thank you to my man, Johnny Crypto, and every single live listener that's out there joining us. If you enjoyed the show, smash the like button on the way out of here. We love you guys. We appreciate you. We'll see you in 23 hours. Like we always say, Warriors, ah, get your shit together, baby. Thank you. Thank no, you. Oh, let's